Okay. Oh no, and it's not starting. I feel like it is? Mm -hmm. Oh, it looks. Oh, I'm blind. Oh, Papa Beach is starting. <laughs> oh, Papa Beach is starting. Ooh. Yeah, but it's stuck up against the end. Oh. How do you feel? It's the change in the air pressure. <laughs> Is not going to do us any favors. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, well. Okie dokie. Hi. Hello. Welcome to Women in STEM. Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> Today we're going to be talking um, staircase. Mm -hmm. Toby. Toby. Mm -hmm. Gender? I hardly know her. <laughs> And Muppets. Muppets. Mm -hmm. What could we be talking about today, Olivia? Drop a comment down below. Let us know what you think we should be talking about. <laughs> it doesn't matter because we're already talking about Labyrinth. <laughs> That's so true. Uh, now, some viewers may remember that we have talked about this in the past. <laughs> we have referenced talking about it in the past on this channel. Mm -hmm. But what happened was that... Um, <laughs> a stolen. calamity. <laughs> <laughs> you may have heard of this. Mm -hmm. Long time viewers will know. Yes, yes, yes. The story of the laptop. Yeah. We were, you know, they tried to silence us. They tried to stop us from speaking out. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this is this is our truth, and we're not going to stop living that truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, we kind of like the movie. <laughs> it's pretty good. And we think it's worth talking about, so that's what we're going to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I mentioned yesterday, actually, in our recording about Ever After, you were talking about the image of when they fall into the water and all the leaves go after them, and it's just so beautiful. And Absolutely. it's one of those images that when you see the movie, and maybe you're kind of too young to really process movies, there's just some sort of image that really sticks in your mind. And one of those, for me, from my childhood, was from Labyrinth. Actually, there were, like, several, but I didn't, like put together that they were the same movie <laughs> until one time we were like reorganizing a closet and I found Labyrinth, like our copy of Labyrinth and I was like, this is the movie <laughs> all these things came together it was such like a moment for me <laughs> um, so yeah we just think, I mean it's like it's visually very fun and interesting um, I think it's well you know, well designed. People obviously worked really hard on it and cared about it. Yeah, and it pays off. In the you know, it looks great as a movie. Mm -hmm. So that's one of our points, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, it it looks great, and it's also it looks weird too. Mm -hmm. Like you can tell the quality is there, even though you know it's kind of like a it's a cult classic now, but it did not do very well at the time it came out. Mm -hmm. Um. And that's it's it's just a very weird movie. It's not like something you'd typically expect to see when you go to the cinema. Mm -hmm. The cinema. <laughs> You've been watching too much British. I gotta TV I gotta stuff. freaking go on a cleanse. I swear, uh. that's unbelievable. To the movies, <laughs> the movie theater, <laughs> the <laughs> movies, <laughs> the cinema, the cinema. Usually, <laughs> typically, when I go to the cinema, I don't expect to see. <laughs> I promise I'm not British. I swear. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, could be worse. Could be French. Anyway, <laughs> it's um, and that's part of what makes it, I think, a cult classic and just such a fun movie is that it is, it took a risk. Mm -hmm. It's like, what if we had David Bowie, a rock star? Mm -hmm. Prance around with a bunch of Muppets. Yeah. It, like, you... Th it sounds like a fever dream, and the whole movie feels like a fever dream, but it's a, it's a work of art. It's a masterpiece. It's so yeah. good. Yeah. And yes. this is one of my complaints about, like, Disney and Marvel m today, is that they aren't taking any risks. They've found a formula, and we were just talking before we started recording about um, uh, this video that I had watched this week how Disney princesses have been adorkable, have had the same, like, personality for, like, ten years. A decade, yeah. Yeah, and it's... It's like you find a formula that works, like, mm -hmm. this is what gets butts in seats. Yeah, 
this is how we get our money back and you just keep doing that yeah instead of taking a risk and even like with labyrinth like you say it kind of bombed when it it came out like it just didn't Mm -hmm. do very well but it's beloved to a lot of people and it's held up over time Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they're just not doing the same thing that everybody else is doing. It was Jim Henson and David Bowie. A perfect combination. Come on. Nobody's doing it like that these days. No, no. And why not? Let's do it, Mm -hmm. you know? It's... I agree. It's absolutely bonkers, but... But that's why... Those are the the kind of things that works. That works, yeah. Yeah. I mean, because I haven't seen everything everywhere all at once, Mm -hmm. but it's one of those kind of movies that, like, it, it took a bit of a risk. It's... I mean, it has um, a few known actors, but no, like, really, really big, hard-hitting names, you know? It's like Um, none of the Chris's. None none of the Chris's, (laughs) yeah. Um, None of the Tom's. Uh, Yeah. Why? They're they're all the same name and face. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, because it's just, I think... Not to disparage any of them as actors, I do think they're doing good work. Yeah. But... It is kind of like you find the same formula of like, oh, this is a very attractive white man. Yeah, who yeah. can do stunt work, and that's what we need for this movie. That's exactly the same as the last movie that we made. You know yeah. what I mean? So true. So it's like mm-hmm. nothing against them as people or as actors, but no. just like hire somebody new that we haven't seen before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, like everything everywhere, it took a narrative risk as well like not just mm-hmm. with casting but it's a it's a bit of a weird story and again i haven't seen it but i have nothing but the highest respect for it because it sounds emotionally like real genuine like there's a a nugget of heart in there that is missing from a lot of other movies and it's that passion for the story like they if you care about a story then there has to be something in the story to care about yeah you know so and it's the same with Labyrinth. Even even though it is weird, even though it feels like a fever dream, and I would say arguably because of those things, that's mm-hmm. what makes it a success and beloved to people. Yeah. Because it's unusual. And they do it very well. Because you can tell that everybody involved cared about it. Like, the actors. David Bowie, like, he put everything into being the Goblin King. Mm-hmm. I didn't know... Um, and I don't think I've told you this. I don't think I even mentioned it on the last one. I didn't know that he was a singer. <laughs> when I was, a, I thought it was, oh, he's an actor that can also sing. That's so fun. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that he was, he's a he singer hired him can also act. because he was David Bowie. Yeah. Yeah. Like, because he just, he did so well. He played the part of Jareth. Yeah. So convincingly and. It's a... David, if you're listening. <laughs> thank you. We, we think about you. you every day. We miss you. <laughs> Come back, our Goblin King. <laughs> um, we could talk about set design. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We get... Um, there's glitter on every conceivable on surface. Yeah. Constantly throughout this movie. Like, it's like walking through this maze and it's like grimy stone, mm-hmm. but this it's also so sparkly. Yeah, <laughs> the cobwebs are sparkly. The broken tree branches are sparkly. Yeah, every where David Bowie enters, he throws a cloud of glitter. Like he's the, just kind very of it, air. He's like the embodiment of glitter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think it kind of. Um, one of the reasons the visual design, including including the set design, is so like memorable and like works so well, is that it completely fits with like the theme of the story. Mm-hmm. Like you're talking about, oh, the plot is kind of like weird. It feels like a fever dream, but that is also like the the point of the narrative, right? Yeah, that we're inside of like Sarah's inner turmoil about her life. And she feels like she's having this experience. She can't tell how much of it is real and how much is from her imagination. Yeah. So I think it helps that, like, even this place that is supposed to be kind of, like, gross and grimy and whatever is also covered with glitter. There's, like, that juxtaposition of, like, what's real and what's kind of more fantasy. Yeah. 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 It works. It works very well. It's just the whole thing has a very sense of unreality. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. 
And it's all practical as well, which mm-hmm. goes a really long way because at the beginning of the movie, we have a CGI owl that kind of hoo, 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 flies in for a really long time. And it does not look great. It's an insanely long time. (laughs) One of the trivia facts about the movie is, did you know that the CGI owl at the beginning is one of the first uses of CGI in a movie? And it's like, yeah, oh, no way. Like, wow. I did know that. Yeah. Um, Because it looks looks very, like, yeah, it it just looks like they haven't really done it before. Like, it's kind of new technology and they're testing the waters, which is great. Yeah, good for them. Um, But I think it's, like... It's interesting, like, how much they had to rely on practical effects because the computer-generated had not really, you know, come come to life yet. Yeah. Um, and that's part of why it, like, holds up so well. Like, these things exactly. look realistic because they are actually physically real. Yes. Whereas, like, and it's one of those things where we don't want to disparage, like animators or like anybody who does cgi for well, their yeah. movies you know like it is a really great tool and technology that like can be really cool in movies but the issue is that again we take it too far yeah that we're not just using it like using it sparingly or using using it as needed and using practical effects as needed like yeah. we kind of like as a supplementary tool with jurassic park yeah where, exactly like, some of the yeah. dinosaurs are practical and some of them are computer generated And it's just, like, how it fits into the scene or what's, like, easiest for people to do, what's going to make the most sense. Yeah. And they both work equally well for that story. But we get to the point where, like, we just think, oh, CGI is, like, cheaper or or whatever. It's it's easier to do than having to, like, sculpt this big thing. And then everything ends up looking like Sharkboy and Lava Girl. Yeah, everything has to rely on that. And uh, let's, like, no hate to Sharkboy and Lava Girl, my beloved, but... <laughs> but, like... <laughs> we're 20 years later, like... <laughs> yeah. how, are, how are we not doing better? Yeah, yeah it definitely lines to the... Like, you feel like you're still there, even now. I'm like, yeah, I'm there. I could be there. Yeah. Whereas uh, some CGI movies from way back then, it's like... It almost pulls you out of the narrative because it's... Hard to suspend your disbelief when it's... Just such a jarring change. Yeah, Yeah. like, it's trying to look realistic. Yeah. Because that's the point of using CGI instead of just, Mm -hmm. like, fully animating something. Yeah. But it's not quite realistic because the the technology just wasn't advanced enough at the time. Yeah. So it's, like, it's not like Space Jam, where it's supposed (laughs) to be a real-life person and an animated. You know what I mean? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And that one, you're just like, whatever, he's with cartoons. Absolutely. But if Bugs something is, is... there. Yeah, like, yeah. if something is CGI animated and supposed to look realistic, it's more... It falls kind of into that, like, Uncanny Valley where you're like, why is that mm-hmm. guy animated? Yeah. <laughs> like, it I just... don't need to... Yeah, it, just, yeah. it feels a little bit uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and people have a lot of uh, beef with, like, the newer Star Wars movies. Um, but that's one thing... Probably rightfully so. Uh, I, Valid. Let's make that <laughs> clear. Um, but one of the best things to see in theaters was Ghost Yoda popping up as a puppet again. Mm-hmm. He's like, it was like the greatest thing I'd ever seen in my life. I'm not even a huge Star Wars person, but I was like, oh, there's Yoda. He's not CGI. Is that everybody? Like, he's there. That's real Yoda. That's yeah. my Yoda. Yeah. yeah. Like, that's it amazing. makes such a difference. And the quality... Why did it do that? <laughs> I don't know. It just turned on all of a you sudden. Know, I don't know. It's probably a ghost. Anyway. Oh, yeah. I think that it does make such a difference. Like, you can, you can just tell... Even with, like, the advancement of technology, things look pretty good, mm-hmm. but there's still, like, just something really refreshing about something that, like, is clearly practical. Like, yeah. Yoda that's an actual puppet. Yeah. And I think that Star Wars is, like, another example of using CGI sparingly. Yeah. Yeah. And it really pays off. Like, if you think of, like, the hologram messages. Yes. And that's, like, the only, you know what I mean? It's like that and, like, the lasers that shoot out of the guns or whatever. Like, it's not a ton of of animation. You know? Yeah, It's yeah. a lot of practical effects. 
and then they kind of fill in the gaps as needed as needed yeah. which again is like at the time that's the technology that they had but I yeah. do think it's a good formula for making something believable now that and we've kind of strayed away from absolutely and I think it was um frustrating to George Lucas at the time and then he went through and like remastered it later with CGI when the technology was available Mm -hmm. which was to its detriment I think and a lot of people a lot of people think that because the lack of CGI and the lack of technology available to like build this world digitally Mm -hmm. forced them to make it practically so and we've mentioned this before on this channel but the um like Tatooine because the budget wasn't huge they just had to like kind of scrounge around and make do with what they could and it really lends itself to this idea that it's yeah that's a run down desert world everything is grimy and dirty and gross and nothing looks fancy and new because obviously not because they do have to like reuse everything and just make things work as best they can yeah absolutely and so when he started like remastering and forcing in CGI then it's like well Buddy White, like, you didn't, you didn't realize what you had. Like, yeah, yeah. And it was the same with um, Lord of the Rings as well. Mm. By the time The Hobbit came out, the technology had evolved to the point where, like, oh my gosh, we don't even need extras. We can just digitally create an army. And it's like, y- you could do that, yeah. but it looks like, so bad, dude. Like, it looks so bad. Yeah. Yeah. So... This was, like, the perfect golden age of technology has advanced a little bit. Just To enough. the point where we can start we can figuring have, out how yeah, to we can do have Jurassic these, like, Park. And, these special effects. Yeah. But we also, like, have still value up knowing how to... The practical effects. Like, have to use things practically. Yeah. And that's one of Jim Henson's, like, greatest legacies yeah. is, like, showing people, hey, okay, these aren't just, like, Muppets just for the kids... It's not just Sesame Street. Like, this is an art form. This is, like, Ludo. Yeah. yeah. I'm still not entirely convinced that's not just a creature they found. Yeah. That, like, don't tell me there's a person in there puppeting him, because that's just, that's a, he just he's just a, a thing on his own. Yeah. He's just his own, he's Ludo, sure. It's astounding how real it looks. hmm Yeah, and the art form is... I think I would say maybe getting more like people are realizing the value there. Yeah. More than they have so. in the past, which is it's good. It's like always how how it is where like you think that you're too cool for something as like a middle schooler, you know. Yeah. You, like you like it as a kid and then you're a teenager and you're like, "Ugh, that's for kids." So lame. And then you like grow up and you're like, "Actually, that was pretty cool." And you like get back into like a lot of people get back into the things they like yeah. as kids. Cuz there wasn't actually anything wrong with it. You're just being angsty teenager, you know what I mean? Yeah, cuz everything is terrible and you're in middle yeah. school. So it's like kind of the same thing where it's like we have to rely on these things so much cuz there's no other option. Yeah. And then there's an option and we do everything with computers because we can. And then you get to the point where you're like, this is kind of bland. Yeah. Like, what if we tried doing stuff the older way again? That was actually kind of cool. Yes. You know what I mean? Just that, like, paradigm shift of realizing what it, what is actually, like, interesting or important to you. Or Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to wipe. Just clean my shirt a little bit. Because he's going to want to wipe. Because he's going to They probably saw him. Shh. Don't tell him. <laughs> Wait, can you go sit on the couch and I'll see if it... Because right now you can see the handprints and stuff, so I wonder if it'll stay that way. Yeah. Yes. Cool. (laughs) Well, you can see... But basically... (laughs) Cool. And we can ignore the wet spot on my shirt because I put a different shirt over it that just happens to match and we didn't even plan it. We're just that cool. Hi. Hi. Welcome back. Thanks. How was your break? Um, it was pretty good. I didn't do much, but, you know. Nothing interesting. It's, like, it's, like, peaceful, you know, not to do so much. Yeah, that's kind of nice. It's nice to have those, like, quiet, yeah. Yeah, that's what I've always thought. Yeah. Um, did you want to talk about gender? 
Oh, sure, we totally can. Okay. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Let's get into it. Um, <laughs> uh, gender in Labyrinth. Mm-hmm. Um, now, this is one of those things that um, video essay guy can explain <laughs> probably much better. Than... Probably. He took two hours to he do it. He took two hours. We love you, by the way. Um, if everyone... Whoever you are. <laughs> yeah. I, do, I don't remember his name. I don't either. I don't but think he even did any, any others, because I looked on his channel, because I was like, I love this guy. I want to see the everything he's ever done. The channel is literally just the Labyrinth video? Yeah. That's incredible. It's, uh, like, astounding. That's amazing. He's, everybody, he's my stop hero. watching this video and go watch this other video instead. You'll have a much better time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which I feel like we say in every video. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday it was Chad Chad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um... No, he's, he's this he's, legend who has created an entire yeah. YouTube channel just to talk For about labyrinth. labyrinth. It's That's am- awesome. And it's an amazing video. Um, mm-hmm. He really breaks everything down. Um, he talks about Jim Henson's other work, compares mm-hmm. it to Pan's Labyrinth. Mm-hmm. It's great. It's phenomenal. Um, and one of the things that he mentions is that, like the recurring themes of sexuality and gender. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a coming-of-age story. And so, any good coming of age story is gonna have like the toe in the water of okay, what do I like? What do I not like? And this is represented by perfectly androgynous David Bowie mm-hmm. with you know makeup and his hair spiked up and glitter everywhere, and also the biggest cod piece in the in world. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just fully representing both genders, and uh, all like like as hundred percent as much as possible. Yeah. yeah, and it's it's kind of funny because you see, and he mentions this in the video as well. But you see a lot of people are like, "Did they know? Like, why they put him in pants so tight? Yeah. Like, oh my gosh, that's so embarrassing for them." And I was like, first it's of like, all, that's David Bowie. <laughs> yeah. It's, like, what do you think? So, like, what are you complaining about? Yeah. And second, like, how do you think that was not an intentional like, it's choice? Like, do you think that there are hundreds of people working on a movie set and none of them notice this? Like, do you think they don't have a costume designer? Yeah. Like, do you think David Bowie, like, wouldn't have questioned it that? didn't say anything? <laughs> if it was, like... <laughs> if it wasn't supposed to be that way. Yeah. They yeah. I, like I think they kept they kept making it bigger as well the cod piece yeah and, like we want it to be as overt as possible we really need to exaggerate this because again it's going back to like Sarah's mindset mm-hmm. and how she's confused about what's going on in her life she's you know being pulled all these different directions because she's an angsty teenager like we've mentioned yeah and so it's yeah it's like the idea of him being androgynous is like I like I think they mentioned like that maybe she's figuring out her own like sexual preferences Mm -hmm. but then also he has to be like very masculine in that way because it's intimidating like she's young and inexperienced and suddenly there's this like there's David Bowie (laughs) you know what I mean (laughs) it's a lot yeah. It's a lot to process, and it's supposed to be that way. You're supposed mm-hmm. to think about, like, why did they do that? And do, does it mean anything? And if so, what does it mean? Like, it's giving you something to think about. It's not just, like, an accident. It's This is basic media literacy, people. Yeah. Like, we're going to do an episode on that in full at some point. Yeah. Because, please, for the love of all that is holy. Like, <laughs> like are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm begging you to just think. Uh. For just a moment. Like, please. Oh, my hell. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. And it's not even just David Bowie. There are a lot of phallic... Im- there's a lot of phallic imagery throughout the whole movie. Like, mm-hmm. a lot of the goblins have, like, very long, bulbous noses. And the mask scene... Uh, the masks in the ballroom scene. Yeah. I mean... Oh, dude. One... Uh, first of all, scene, scene of all time. It's so beautiful. There's, like, so much about it. I really think, like, this is one of those... We did um, The Princess Bride mm-hmm. in several parts talking about, like, specific character tropes. Yeah. And, like, Labyrinth, honestly, like, it's not that long of a movie. Mm-mm. It's an hour and a half, which is... But there's... Which perfect. is the perfect, like, perfect. perfect. 
but like there's genuinely so much about it like we could especially just because we love it so much we could just sit down and talk about like one scene at a time yeah easily absolutely and we might at some point but i think we're probably gonna do that with triple r verse <laughs> yeah that's gonna be a 10 parter <laughs> yeah. minimum yeah, minimum yeah. um but like yeah there's so much to talk about in the ballroom scene again like it's very visually stunning it's it kind of like sticks with you even if you haven't seen the movie for a while that's likely to be one of the images that you remember yeah because it, um, it i mean if the whole thing feels kind of like a fever dream this, this is feels a dream like, within a dream. Yeah. This is Shakespearean. Level. Absolutely. Like <laughs> it feels it feels so surreal. I mean, the huge dress. Yeah. For, I mean, okay, listen Camila Cabello. <laughs> Again, I know it's not your fault. You didn't actually design those dresses. That was just your character. Yes. That was pretend. But what if you had worn anything even close? To Sarah's ball gown from Labyrinth. <laughs> that is a show-stopping gown. Absolutely. That's what people... That people would take you seriously. Yes. They would invest in your business or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. like... That's a dress. Yeah. Not six layers of tan tulle no, with a purple no, sash. No, no, It's 12 layers. She's wearing 12 gowns. Yeah. Like, it's the it's most huge. extravagant, beautiful thing. And some... Like, it fits her elegantly. It You'd does. You'd think it would be too much, but it's like... It just works so well because yeah, well, this is again she's like got the big hair, like it's the big like luscious curls, yeah, and the little like off the shoulder like poof that is the, so eighties. The, the poof. I mean, it's perfect, and it's again like in her own mind, she's figuring all this stuff out, and now yeah. in this dream within a dream, she gets to be a princess at a masquerade ball. Yeah, but there's something a little bit wrong about it. Yeah, the and, laughter's too loud. There's and she can't, you know, she's dancing too fast. The the room is spinning, spinning, you know, and this it's she's again dancing with David Bowie. <laughs> she's dancing with David Bowie, and the again the visual design ties in the plot and the deeper meaning, the characterization. Like they all work so well together, as evidenced in this scene. Yeah, where like she gets to be like a, a beautiful princess and wear the gown of everybody's dreams everything she thought and she wanted everything is glittery and it's everything she thought she wanted but there's something dizzying about it that's disorienting and so you know that there's something a little bit wrong yeah it's like it's perfect it's so the right. ballroom scene is so good <laughs> it's really good <laughs> dizzying is the perfect word to yeah. describe it it's oh, it's overwhelming mm-hmm. it's fantastic and then David Bowie just kind of dipping in and out of frame delicately until all of a sudden he's there in his full glory and just like sweeps her off her feet and this is i mean the complexity in david bowie's acting is it's insane but the the character of jareth as a whole is is so fascinating to think about as well because he's cast by sarah to be both the villain and the love interest Mm-hmm. This is something that she doesn't fully understand. And so this is something that the character, Jareth, cannot fully understand. He's right. doing his best like, to what play do you both want me parts. To be? Yeah. yeah, and that's exactly what he says later is you... What does he say? Um, you um, cowered from me. I was frightening. Yeah. I, like, he did these things because that's what she wanted maybe subconsciously like this dream world of hers this is what she's designing she wants him to be the the villain that she can vanquish at the end but also maybe the love interest who's here to sweep her off her feet in a beautiful ballroom scene and Mm -hmm. like it's so confusing to jareth because he's he's doing the best he can to play both parts but they're inherently like um what's the word that i'm looking for opposing opposing yeah thank you he can't be both, but he's trying to be both. He, and, like, how If the person telling, like, creating the story doesn't know what they want, then none of the characters really know how to move the story forward. Yeah. Especially with Jareth, because he has to be her, like, I, I don't know, whatever that word is. He's he's opposite of her in all the scenes, whether mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. as a love interest or as a villain. Yeah. So it's hard to be, like, to be somebody's, like, main scene partner all the time 
yeah. but you have no idea what the scene is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, it's got to be devastating. Yeah. And he plays that confusion very, very well. Because it doesn't... It comes across as... Not as David Bowie doesn't know what he's doing, but as... Jareth playing a part. And that's... Yeah. That's a... An entirely different way to do it. Way to play the scene. And... Yeah. Th- and watching it as a kid without all these, like, different lenses and layers... Yeah, yeah. You just think, like, Jareth is being cruel... Because he keeps changing his mind, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. and then like later with more, like thinking about it in a more complex way, it's like, well, you know, that's kind of true, but also he keeps changing his mind and changing what part he's playing because Sarah keeps changing her mind and he just has to do whatever's opposite of her. Yes, yes, yeah. It's exquisite. Mm-hmm. It's so good. Exactly what a girl creating her own story would be like a teenage girl she doesn't know what she wants yeah and at in the end she you have no power over me i am in control and that's i mean it's such an incredible lesson for sarah to learn but also it's a really it's a fun thing for a coming of age story to say like okay like because that's i think when you really start to become an adult is when you say I am in control of everything in my life. Mm-hmm. And obviously there are things out of your control, but to realize that you do have more control than you think mm-hmm. and that you, no one else has power over you, it's a, it's a really powerful lesson yeah. for anyone growing up to learn. Yeah. And it just, it gives you a lot more power and a lot more strength. And we see that at the end that she's like ready to go back to her real world, not ready into entirely to give up her friends her that she's friends, made. Yes, yeah. but more equi- more better, more equipped to move ahead. Yeah. I think that idea of learning that your your life is your own and nobody else has like power over you without letting them is very like it's embodied very well in Sarah because she feels so put upon by the world. In the beginning of the story. Yeah. She's, like, so upset that her dad got remarried and she has to babysit. She's like, my life is so hard. And that's another fun thing I like about this movie. And she just feels so, like, the expectations that her stepmother may or may not even be putting on her. Because we only see the stepmother for, like, two Two minutes. Mm -hmm. But, like, she, like, her life is so difficult. And you just have to, because she's telling the story, you just have to believe, Sarah, that all of these things are as hard as she's making them out to be. Yeah. You know? And then it's not till the end where she, like, kind of realizes, like, oh, I can I can decide how to react to things. Yeah. Even if I can't change my circumstance, I'm going to change my response to this. And I'm going to actually care about Toby because... Like, he's my brother, and not because yeah. he's my dumb responsibility. An obligation. Yeah. 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 It's, it's a nice, like, moment of, of growth for her. Yeah. She still gets to invite her her Muppet friends over for a party at the end of the movie. Like, she hasn't fully grown up, but she's better equipped to handle these things and maybe have a better, like, perspective on what's going on with, like, her stepmother, for example. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Because she's like, oh, this isn't... I'm not being tortured <laughs> into taking care no of a baby. No one's gonna die. <laughs> no one's gonna die. It's yeah. just like <laughs> actually not a big deal. Yeah. I'm literally babysitting. Um, and that's what I was saying. I was like, I really like how at the beginning she's unlikable. Like actively an irritating character. And I love that because as I was saying before about like Disney's adorable personality princesses and, like, there are good things that they've done in, as well. It's not like that completely negates every good thing that they've done in the story. Like, more inclusion and more diverse, like, stories. That's great. But the idea that Sarah comes into this movie and she's immediately, like, so bratty and so self-absorbed. And, like, she has very significant flaws as a person. Not as a character, but, like, as a an individual. She's so focused on herself and it's I think it's frustrating more because everyone has been that person Mm -hmm. you know it's like 
and a lot of us have like learned to grow past that hopefully um but it's like it's kind of frustrating to be shown a mirror of your flaws that you've had in the past and to be like exposed to it but it's also very refreshing to see a character that they're not trying to make to fully persuade the audience to be like no she's she's perfect she's never done anything wrong like mm-hmm. no she she has she's like, made she's, mistakes yeah 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 like it's not like that she's the main character that you're supposed to look up to because she's such a you know like you're supposed to look up to this one the most because she has the most the best values or whatever like, you're right you're supposed she's to the relate ideal. to a character yes because she's a person yeah and not because she's an ideal yeah yeah exactly and and she, like like you said she grows she becomes i mean she works hard to take care of toby and you know make this journey for herself but also to like actively take care of her baby brother mm-hmm. like she she grows as a person she and also that's just kind of how teenagers are yeah <laughs> like that yeah that's absolutely a teenager that is 100% how yeah. it's like you want to do your own thing like yeah. whatever you're interested in and people are always telling you what to do and it can be really hard to like to get a handle on like people are telling me to do these things you know because they're actually good for me to do and not because they're trying to ruin my life and take away everything that I like to do (laughs) you know what I mean (laughs) like being a teenager sucks it really does if any of you (laughs) out there are teenagers like be strong it gets better it does it really does the world is not always out to get you Mm -mm. And you can you can do the stuff that you want to do, and it's okay. Absolutely. <laughs> like, you're going to be fine, I promise. <laughs> what are we hearing about? Oh, this couple broke up again. Yeah. I don't care. At all. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Stop talking about Jada Pinkett Smith and start talking about Bridget Mendler, who apparently is incredible. Yeah, everybody go look at her Wikipedia page, because she's, like, freaking baller. The Music and Labyrinth. I mean, it's written by David Bowie. It's written by David Bowie. And, and it just goes... He's also the love interest slash villain. So, like, what can he not do? He has the He was, he the, was the, the Bridget Mendler of <laughs> male, <laughs> male pop stars in the 80s. I mean, it, that's an overused phrase, but we really mean it here. <laughs> <laughs> he really was. <laughs> it was our boy David. Yeah. Okay? And he... So, like... It just totally captures everything that we've been saying about the movie so far, is that it it feels like a dream. Mm -hmm. The music does not feel... Like, it's not... It's not the way that a musical is done, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like Mm -hmm. the songs are there to, like, move the narrative along or show a a deep, like, thought process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they match the movie, because he wrote them for the movie, Mm -hmm. but it's not like a direct description of each scene it's his his mind yeah is just it I it's, mean, it's this, like what it's do you the soundtrack say? yeah yeah like uh, yeah exact that's exactly the soundtrack yeah he's done it it's like people try to find good soundtracks for their movies and they're they're good or whatever mm-hmm. but then david bowie's like i'm just gonna I'm just gonna do it myself, and it's like nothing could have matched the movie or this particular scene better. Yeah, than what he did, like within you. It's Shut up! Been, it's been <laughs> yeah, we've it's going right now. <laughs> Live without the sunlight, <laughs> love without your heartbeat. And he's just talking about how like she's being a little confusing. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm uh, he's such a poet. poet. He's such a poet. He is. Can you imagine hearing that song for the first time in person? And he's like, you have to act. You have to, like, I've got to find my baby brother. But, like, David Bowie is singing that at you. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, Sarah Connolly. We talked a lot about David Bowie. Jennifer but like Connelly. Sarah, Jennifer Connolly. I said Sarah. The character. Her, that's yeah. her name. Jennifer Connolly. It's because she does it so well. She's just Sarah to me. <laughs> Jennifer, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, you did really well. Because <laughs> I couldn't have done it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think it's crazy. Yeah. It's like a Bill Withers lyric or like a Bee Gees lyric where you're like, that is so poetic. Yeah. 
For for why? For what? <laughs> yeah. How could you do this to me? Yeah, it's not, a Saturday morning. I can't, <laughs> I can't. I can't. I can't. It's like. I mean, hello. Was that you? Stop making sounds. It sounded like it was sick. <laughs> what? <laughs> So we're normal. Yeah. <laughs> I'm an adult. I'm an adult. <laughs> Amanda, Amanda, if you're watching. <laughs> this has gone too far. I don't, I don't think we should be friends anymore. <laughs> okay. It's, I'm forgetting who I am. It's nice knowing you. I'll yeah. see you never. Yeah. yeah. Get out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, what if we, besides the fact that we accidentally wore matching outfits today, this is too much. <laughs> like, what do we do? Do we get into a fight? I guess. Should we argue about something? The thing is, like, we always want to do that, but then we can't think of anything that we actually both genuinely feel passionate about in opposite directions. Yeah. So it's just a fight for the fun of it. Yeah. You know, it's like, who would win in a physical fight, a moose or a bison? And I'm like, well, what if a moose could jump on top of the bison like Mario? You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, that's not actually how I feel. But it's for the sake of the argument, because we just both have too much fun arguing. We really, yeah. It yeah. just wouldn't work. No. And we can't do a, a bit, because then that just... Because that's the issue. Yeah, that's, We've yeah. been leaning into this bit for too long. We're like Sean and Gus. Their number one, like, <laughs> their love language is committing to the bit. Anyway, music is good. Music is good. Music I've, is good. I've always said that. That's yeah. I can corroborate that. The Killers. Not to bring them up again, but um, <laughs> sometimes I can't listen to them early in the morning because I want to have a good day. And <laughs> if I listen to like Spaceman or Just on the Girl or West Hills too early, yeah. then I just simply can't function. Yeah. It's not that it's not a good song and that it will ruin my day. It's that it will ruin me. Because it's like, too good of a song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel I've like I could listen to Spaceman derailed. early in the morning because it's just so like energizing. Dude. Yeah, Spaceman was a bad example. It's electrifying, it's, but yeah, it's... just another girl would be like, "Why are you starting your day with that? Like, come on, are you in the throes of depression?" <laughs> It's like that tweet that's like, like relax. Girl, why are you listening to Sweater Weather at 10 in the morning? Yeah. <laughs> What's going on with you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's. True. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's like there's no excuse for that. No. No. Um, I can't think of anything else to say on the subject of Labyrinth. I know I have some because. Because this is the second recording we've done yes. of this. Um, I don't know. I feel like we've covered all the, like, main things. Mm-hmm. It's very well made. You can tell people cared a lot about it. Yeah. We love David Bowie. We, we love, love Jim Bowie. Henson. And Absolutely. this is a this is a cult classic for a reason. It's mm-hmm. worth watching. Mm-hmm. If you haven't mm-hmm. seen it or if you just haven't seen it for a while, you should watch we it watch again. It. And you should watch the videos that we have talked about. Yeah. Because they're also good. Supplemental, you know, homework. Yes. Yes. So I think that's it, you know? Yeah. I think so. Thank you for watching. Um, and b- goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> How long was the last like audio snippet while we were sitting here? Do you know? Ten minutes and three seconds. So then, why would this not have worked? Did it not? No. no. See, look, like this one right now that's yeah. recording. Mm-hmm. We'll say it is twenty seconds. Normal. Sure.